Hello everyone. Welcome to another Let's Play of the ATD Interactive Remake of King's Quest II. My name is Anna Mardal. When we last left off, we were deep in the heart of the Sharky Kingdom. We're looking for King Neptune's trident. We know where the trident is. It's in this throne room. But these guards are in our way. I know of no way to, to distract them except to sacrifice our horse. Having an idea, you approach your somewhat reluctant steed and slap him hard on the back. Look at him go! The guards are momentarily distracted. Now is your chance. We're going to go... We watched the ne the Sharky King press these shells. You push the shell, it moves slightly back into the wall. Oh, there we go. Despite yourself, you cannot help but marvel at the treasure. It must have been collected or stolen over many years, and as such, there are coins and jewels originating from all over the world. The trident is rusty and corroded. It looks like a pitchfork. Without delay, you snatch up the trident before the guards return to their posts. It appears as if the guards are losing interest in the seahorse. You'd better get out of here quickly. So let's leave the way we came. Oh no! The seahorse has followed you all the way back to the secret entrance. The guards are sure to discover you now. Okay. You remount the seahorse. Oh, I really wish I could have saved my game. Your seahorse glides onward, flicking its little tail faster than ever. You grip the reins tightly, glancing nervously over your shoulder every so often to check for pursuing sentries. As you make distance, your anxiety melts into relief, but it is to be short-lived. The following is a short arcade sequence. Do you want to play through it? We have to hit yes, or you don't get the points. Oh crap, okay, so the arrow designate lets you know that a rock is coming and to avoid it. Okay. Are they still catching up with us? They're still catching up with us! What am I doing wrong? Finally, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. You make a dash for the exit. Oh. As you emerge, you realize you have only seconds before the guards come out after you. And even if you could outrun them, you're sure the commotion would attract the sentry's attention. Then you'd be in real t trouble. Suddenly, you hear a strange voice in your head. He of noble and good will, royal trident thou may wield. The Sharky King said that people of good will can use the trident. We used the trident on the cave wall. You wonder what that did, if anything at all. Oh, so that's what that did. 
we managed to turn the invisible wall into a, or the <laughs> immaterial wall into a material one. Now we need to get out of here. We're going to go two screens right. One screen up. Two screens right. Okay, I like that those random sharks aren't an actual challenge because... Oh, hello. Sharks actually don't just go around attacking people constantly. My guide has led me wrong and now we are on our own. But we know we just need to go east. And this is where we were dropped off, I'm pretty sure. We made it! The trident guides you back to Neptune's realm. We should let them know that there's an invasion coming tomorrow. You approach the king. He smiles and graciously accepts his trident from you. Then he calls everyone to attention. To commemorate the return of my trident and to honor King Graham's success, I call for a celebration. The celebration lasts for some time. You eat, drink, and have a merry time with many of the merpeople. After a few hours, the festivities wind down and you finally have a chance to speak with Neptune alone. The gems of nature represent the three stages of life. Water gives birth to life, and thus what I have given you is the first of the three. Second is the growth gem, or air gem, for air sustains life and permits it to grow. How might I find the growth gem? I only know that its location is as far above the surface of the land as we are below it. Beyond that, I cannot aid you. A smirk crosses Neptune's face momentarily. I'm having to keep click out, clicking out so we don't miss the dialogue. You might say that air is not exactly my element. You decide that the beverages consumed were to blame for that one. And the third gem, your majesty? Third is the death gem. The completion of life and the natural order of things. The door of destiny understands this now, as did the ancients who imprisoned the soul within. As for that gem's location, I had hoped you would have no business venturing to the castle. Kalima was once ruled from that place. But sadly, her people have not seen their lord for quite some time. If you please, I would prefer not to dwell upon this subject. Good luck, King Graham, and good speed. You depart the underwater kingdom and head back towards the surface. What an incredible experience! You are certain you will never forget the adventure you just had. Additionally, you have acquired one of the gems. As you resurface, you realize that the magic which allowed you to breathe underwater has now subsided. It is a slightly luminescent blue stone about the size of your palm. We seem to have lost our bottle with the fish in it. Which is good. Uh, we, um, I wouldn't want to condemn them to death uh, out here on the beach. And obviously they wouldn't want to be released in the upper levels of the ocean. They would want to be 
free down in the, the, the depths that they're built for and made for. I guess we'll hold on to our gem. I think we could go to the uh, door of destiny and go ahead and start slotting things in, but let's just hold on to it. One of the things we picked up in the ocean was a little cloth. And I wonder if the sneezy person thing in the haystack could use a handkerchief. Here, this might help your sneezing. Oh, thanks. Here, you can have this back now. You retrieved the partially used cloth from the haystack. Feel better? Yeah, it's good to be able to... Bruh, 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 a chew! Interesting. A shiny silver, silver needle lies on the ground near the haystack. Well, it's mine now. Grim finds so many needles in haystacks. Whoever or whatever is inside no longer responds to your inquiries. The librarian and possible witch, librarian witch, gave us a book about the underwater kingdom. And I wonder if she might give us something else now. As you watch the pendulum swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you feel a bit lightheaded. A large grandfather clock sits against the wall. It seems to keep good time. The clock indicates it is afternoon. It was morning before. That's interesting. So this is a game in which time passes. Yes. Could you recommend another good book? There. The book is entitled Legends. Browsing through it, you notice an interesting excerpt. Daventry's first king, known to many as Legenamor, is as much an enigma of history as he is woven into the fabric of legend itself. Though his passing occurred nearly 1,000 years ago, it remains somewhat unclear as to the manner of his death and what became of the power he wielded. Historians, historians do know that Legenamor was a powerful magician, or a wizard, as he might be called nowadays. He is largely credited with bringing, along with his kind, magic and civility to Daventry and the surrounding world. According to legend, during what was arguably the bloodiest war Daventry has ever seen, Legenamor sought to commit his awesome power to the cosmos. It is believed that he blamed himself for the extent of the Grand War in particular, the magic that had been used to exacerbate the death toll. He therefore chose to render himself mortal, an action that would prove to be his last. However, legend would also suggest that his power may be attainable if only one were to perceive and understand how and when. This is evidenced by a parchment located just a few centuries ago and dated 30 years after the king's death. If seeketh you the power of Legenamor, thou shalt be well praised. It will not be an easy task, from the path thou may be swayed. For in great Daventry lies the means, for which may be found, belonging to one who rules the land, by one who wears the crown. From this circle nature springs, from royal thoughts thus sown, though woe betide the unjust thief who claims it for his own. In this great land tis known to rest the corpse of Legenamor, who died defending his home turf 
in the longest, fiercest war. His great mistake, which sealed his fate, he cast his magic aside, up high into the heavens, which forever stretches wide. But the search may be rewarding for the seeker of this power, as its apex soon approaches, when cometh the darkest hour. Hark, spy sun and moon and planets, as all of them align. The one prepared for the ascension will surely see the sign. Power thus can then be granted to just one from this great tool. If one be thee, then thou shalt be the everlasting jewel. The first king's brother, Morjailin, was also presumed killed in the Grand War. Legenomor's loyal first knight and successor, Granthithor, ruled, ruled over the realm for nearly 50 years. He sired a number of children who either remained to guarantee the continuation of the royal bloodline or set forth to build kingdoms of their own. Well, that was maybe less immediately useful than the section on mermaids. here uh an antique store we actually haven't visited it before now we should do that now actually no we shouldn't do that now i didn't check to see if the librarian has anything else to say she usually doesn't but yes could you recommend another good book oh there's more than one good book per chapter. There. What's this one say? This book is entitled Power, Politics, and Pulpits. Browsing through it, you notice an interesting excerpt. Oh my, this is a long one. Power, Politics, and Pulpits. In many lands, the church and state have long shared a mutual distrust of one another. While the state is responsible for the wealth and security of the realm, the church's concern is for the moral standing of the population. It is said that when one intrudes upon the domain of the other, discord is inevitable. In no other place has this more, more unpleasant than in Kalimaw. The feud between the two institutions there dates back many decades. Okay, that's interesting because we did see that there's a chapel and they left a card in the mailbox. In the days of the late Count Kraestrom, the Lord of Kalima spoke openly of the need for change, chiefly regarding the education of the common people. The Church of the Faith maintained that the simple people were of the land. They knew their rightful place, and thus their path was secure. Years later, the young and idealistic Count Caldor, Kraestrom's heir, declared that the Church of the Faith had purposely been holding the people back retaining their ignorance of literature and the wider world for their own selfish benefit. Naturally, the church resented the insinuation, and in turn declared Kaldar a he heathen. At that time, the mood of the population tensed. Stability in the realm had weakened as dissension between church and state rose. It may have continued to do so had the situation not been annulled by tragedy. The Count befell a terrible injury while in the forest one night, which later proved fatal. While it expressed its condolences to the family of the fallen lord, the Church of the Faith asserted that only through its own vision for Kalima, not the rulers, could the people find their true path. It is a curious point to note that no new leader has been chosen to replace Kaldor, though it has been many years since his passing. When questioned about this, the townsfolk are likely, likely to either ignore the inquiry altogether or cast a further furtive glance in the direction of the now inaccessible castle. Okay. So, the church has been keeping people in ignorance in order to bilk them for tithes and offerings. And when a count tried to challenge the church, he, whoops, suddenly died.
Would that be the Count who is a member of the library who the librarian says is dead? There have been no new Counts since him, apparently. You have nothing else to say to the librarian at the moment. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Now we'll go try this shop. Well, this is a pretty little place. You are inside a cute little antique shop. Old furniture and knickknacks clutter the place. Against the wall, a low bench displays an assortment of items. Dragon fire! Oh no, wait, it's just a mounted dragon head. A large and incredibly hefty looking mallet is propped up against the shelf. A small engraving on its head reads Broggy. Broggy was the name of the ice giant in Quest for Glory 1. A strange cylindrical and slender container sits high upon the shelf. The markings on it read 7-Up. What on earth is that thing? I've got a sprite here. <laughs> Apparently this interesting looking item is a model DX cartridge retrieval unit. Quite useful, quite a useful little device in another time and place. Oh, I think that's a Space Quest reference. And uh, in King's Quest 1, when they talk, or sorry, in Heroes Quest 1, when they talk about two guys from Andromeda, that is a Space Quest reference as well. This is a red sorcerer's hat. A tiny heart. How cute. Possibly a King's Quest 5 reference. Obviously, the Swiss haven't quite got the idea yet. It's a Swiss army knife. I don't know what that is. It doesn't have a description. More does that. There are some phases on display in the antique shop. Okay, I think that's all. Some old shields are lying in the antique shop. A rather beaten and tarnished brass lamp is positioned on the countertop. The little old lady is tiny, with twinkling blue eyes. Her white hair is done up in meat bun on top of her head. Oh, sorry. She appears at first to be in her 60s. Then you notice the sheer quantity of makeup on her face and decide she may well be older than that. That doesn't mean anything. People of all ages wear lots of makeup. What is it with these games and their angst about makeup? Good afternoon. What can I do for you, dear? Hello. Do you sell anything that would aid an ascent of a mountain? Unfortunately, I do not sell climbing equipment or anything of that sort. This is really a specialist store. Oh. However, I do have an item which you might find useful. This lamp. It's said to contain a genie. Never tried it myself, of course. I do not believe in using magic to solve my problems. Nature has made us as we are, and we should be glad of that. Uh-huh. How much for the lamp? The lady hesitates. You sense that she wants more from you than your money. You hope it is not anything you will regret. Well, seeing as how you are a man who seems adept at taking care of himself, perhaps you could do a small favor for me. Somehow you knew she was going to say that. I once owned a beautiful nightingale. Quite rare around here, but the sentimental value far outweighs its monetary worth. That foul old witch, Hagatha, has stolen it from me, probably to use in some concoction or another. Her nose screws up in disgust. So if you could be a sweetie and retrieve it for me, I will trade you the lamp for the bird. Agreed? Well, I will see what I can do. Do be careful. If Hagatha should spot you out of her good eye, then you'll be in for it. Really? I have nothing more to say because I feel like I have lots of things to say. Twin axes grace the wall above the front door. You wonder if they serve as a security measure for intruders. Okay. Well. There's a lot of nightingales in this game. Which I may have spelled wrong. I can't remember if it's Nightingale or Nightingale. Um, there's a, a Nightingale in King's Quest Seven, 
who also needs retrie- retrieving. There's um, Cosima's Nightingale in King's Quest VI. I feel like there's been others. I, I feel like maybe there was one in King's Quest I. Um, we know where the witch cave is because we've seen it. We saw it in a... cutscene, and then later, <gasps> you have run into an evil enchanter. Get out of here fast before he turns you into something. <sighs> Jerk. Oh. A sinister looking cave can be seen to the north of here. It is a human skull with a radiant blue stone wedged into its eye socket. Well, that looks familiar. We've seen one very similar to that in King's Quest or, or Quest for Glory 1 and 4. This is a human skull with a large eye socket. It's no gem inside them. Unless you're mistaken, the symbol above the cave entrance bears a striking similarity to a bat. A shiver runs down your spine as you look at it. It's almost as if some dark force were radiating from it. Can he talk? He's way past talking these days. Can we take the gem? As you face the skull towards the image of the bat above the cave, you notice its wing has faded slightly. However, you suspect that whatever danger the bat represents is still in effect. Huh. This skull looks like it is designed to be pivoted on a stake. However, there appears to be something missing. There was a blue gem in the skull. And we have a blue gem. But I'm loath to use it. As you attempt to place the bird gem into the skull, you discover it does not fit properly. Instead, it juts out uselessly like a bulging eyeball. The bird gem protrudes from the skull. You need to somehow push it in further. Oh, man. Very nervous. You gently tap the birth gem with the mallet, hoping not to break it. It budges only slightly. You give it a harder hit, and it moves a bit more. You hold your breath and give the gem an almighty thwack. It pops into the skull. The bird gem is now fully inside the skull's eye socket. With the bird gem now firmly in place, you turn the leftmost skull so that it phases the bat symbol above the cave entrance. The power of the two skulls combined has caused the symbol to disappear. You sense whatever danger it represented has now subsided. Whew. Let's go in. As you enter, you are almost overwhelmed by the foul stench which molests your nostrils. It is obviously coming from whatever Hagatha is cooking in that large cauldron of hers. There are some things of interest on the other side of the cave, but you have no means of crossing over there safely this time. A caged nightingale sits on the floor near the northern cave wall. The light from outside barely penetrates the interior of this cave. So long as you keep your distance, Hagatha shouldn't notice you. This is a crystal ball, fairly standard equipment for those of magical persuasion. A glass dome, semi-spherical in shape, sits on the table. It reminds you of a shakable snow dome toy that you once owned as a child. This is the ugliest old lady you've ever seen. She has warts all over her face and matted gray hair. She clasps her stick with claw-like hands. A simple but elegant black cloak hangs on the stand. 
A gilded cage sits to one side of the cave. A beautiful nightingale flits nervously inside. The cage is locked and chained securely to the wall. So it sounds like the first thing we need is a key. Well, what's going on? She's she's talking. And I missed what she said. Being quiet as a mouse, you slide your hand inside the cloak to discover a deep pocket amongst sticky and disgusting spell ingredients. You find a tiny silver key and a peculiar golden ring-shaped device. to get closer, Grand. You turn the silver key into the lock. It fits. You turn it si silently and the chain falls to the ground. I don't want the bird making noise when we pick it up, so let's put the cloth over its cage. You silently drop the cloth over the cage. Without a sound, you take the nightingale into your possession. cage still has cloth draped over it. You'd better wait until you're outside again before removing the cloth. It did it again. Hold on a second. I don't know what it said. The fluid of blood with bone and flesh. We'll walk in and we'll see what it says. I skipped past it by accident without meaning to. Uh-oh, Hagatha has seen you. Well, you are the gentleman saving me a lot of trouble by coming here. You wandered into the witch's lair and where you stood gave not a care. She soon saw you, a smile she gave, your flesh, your blood, your bones she craved. Oh, that's not which one I wanted to restore. I wanted to restore this one so we can hear what it says she's chanting. Does that mean she's seen us? Does that mean, what does that mean? You hear Hagatha begin a chant of some kind while stirring her brew. The fluid of blood with flesh and blown blood will, t will make my complexion young, inducing time to reverse its sail. All I need is a sweet nightingale. Okay, so she is concocting something. Oh, don't make me watch it again. Let me restore. She is concocting something, and the thing she is concocting is a youthening potion that requires a nightingale. It will make my complexion young and fresh. You can't remove the birch gem while the blue light is streaming from it. If you want to dislodge it, you'll have to use force. Alright. You strike the skull with all your strength, and it shatters easily. The birch gem clatters to the ground, along with a multitude of bone fragments. You reacquire the bone, the birch gem. You have no desire to carry around fragments of someone else's skull. Let's skedaddle. Quickly, quickly. Actually, what happens if we do try to enter with the bat in place? Oh, jeez Louise. You saw black glow. You did not slow. Turned not away. You've had your day. Spikes in the ground. That's brutal. And somewhat answers the question of why. Oh, wait, evil enchanter. And somewhat answers the question of why the townspeople haven't broken out the pitchfork and torches to get rid of her. I guess you could still lob in a Molotov cocktail. That's kind of the Jason Mendoza strategy. Portals! Oh, jeez. So 
Sorry, I did not mean to hit the microphone. Well, now we can return... the Nightingale to... the nice, sweet, antique shop lady who just wants her bird back. Much like Fernando did in the, um... You remove the cloth from the cage. Looking at the bottom of the cage, you find a letter that has become stuck to it. You peel it off. A letter? You read the letter. My dear sister, it has been a while since my last letter to you, and quite an age since we last spoke. Such are the busy lives we lead. I know of your preoccupation with eliminating the competition, and wish you well in that ongoing endeavor. As for my part, the servant I have owned for the past 17 years is soon to come of age. It will almost be a shame to kill this one, for he is quite adept at his chores. But tradition must be observed at all times. I shall require a replacement in the not too distant future. Perhaps I should think up a new name for my next slave, though it is that much easier when I need only remember one. I've asked the father to notify me at once should he hear of any likely candidates? Speaking of which, though it is in no way my place to question the will of the father, for surely he has the best interest of all his followers at heart, does he not spend so much time locating that item of legend which he has been seeking for almost a millennia? While he is not to be second-guessed, I do wonder, is he so assured of its existence that he is willing to turn his attention away from his flock for so long a time? As for our remote brother, he seems increasingly interested in the ladies these days. I believe he has an eye on a royal couple who are expected to conceive a girl within the ear, or so the signs say. I must confess, if he's prepared to wait so many long years for the child's maturation before abducting her, then he has far more patience than I. I await your reply, dear sister, and hope that this letter finds you well. If you have the chance to speak with the father, perhaps you will inquire of his commitment to this item he seeks. I would advise the utmost discretion, naturally, your loyal and by far the better sibling, M. So, this is a note that requires a little bit of knowledge of <clears throat> King's Quest canon to decipher. The reference to boy slaves, boy servants, who are killed when they turn 17, clues us in that this letter is from Mononon the evil wizard who kidnaps Graham's son, Alexander, and keeps him as a servant for 17 years. We talked about Mononon in King's Quest V because as part of escaping from Mononon, Alexander turns him into a cat in King's Quest III. And then King's Quest V occurs when Mononon's brother Mordak kidnaps Graham's family in an attempt to force Alexander to turn Mononon back into a human. We see that reference here as well, a remote brother who is interested in the ladies and has his eye on a royal couple expected to conceive a girl within a year. Um, that is a reference, presumably, to Mordak and Kasima. I don't know if it's canon that Mordak actually planned, even before Kasima's birth, to kidnap her. Um, but this uh, fan remake letter is making it so, thus. And uh, this ties Mononon together with Hagatha um, as brother and sister. And I believe that is Sierra canon, although I, I think it's retconned. Th there is kind of a... Um... <laughs> so, 
out of universe, all these games kept happening because people wanted to play them. So it meant interesting and tragic things kept happening to the Daventry family. And one way to explain that, shy of them just having really bad luck, would be to make the antagonists related to each other so that at a certain point, the their actions are easily explained by enmity with the family uh, as much as any other reason. So in King's Quest 2, if we meddle in Hagatha's affairs, right, and it's been strongly implied already in the introduction that Hagatha is the reason for Valamis's imprisonment, and we say that again here, um, it says that you are uh, preoccupied with eliminating your competition. Um, so if Hagatha is keeping Valanis captive, and if Graham thwarts Hagatha, which we hope to do, um, then it explains why Mononon would pick Alexander, Graham's son, as his next captive servant to keep and kill. And then, in turn, Mononon's defeat explains Mordak's obsession with the Daventry family in King's Quest V. So it's a way of explaining why tragic things keep happening to this one family. They're not unlucky. They've anchored a largest family of extremely powerful antagonists. So, so this is mostly a, f a, a, a fan letter to kind of pull all that together. You, you have King's Quest II references with Hagatha keeping Valanis um, captive. Then we talk about King's Quest III with uh, Alexander's imprisonment. And we talk about King's Quest VI and V for that matter with Mordak uh, kidnapping Cosima. What I don't know is this reference to the father who seems to be someone they follow rather than being biologically related to, although it could be both. Um, spending time locating an item of legend which he has been seeking for almost a millennium. Is he so assured of its existence that he is willing to turn his attention away from his flock for so long a time? So that's interesting. The letter puzzles you, but you put it away and continue your quest. I don't know if it means anything, but it's interesting that Hagatha stuck the letter in the birdcage. Was that to line the cage for the bird to poop on? Does she not like Mononon or perhaps didn't like his advice? I don't know. It might just be a, 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 a way to get it into our possession. You poke the bird and it responds by pecking your finger, not what I meant to do. Here is your beloved nightingale back. You offer the nightingale to Angelina. The sheer elation on her face almost makes the whole risk worth the while. She snatches it from you and proceeds to fuss over the bird. You wait for a moment, but it seems she no longer notices you. Ahem, if you don't mind. About the lamp you promised me in trade for the nightingale? The shopkeeper looks up at you vaguely. She gradually remembers that there is another being in her world. Yes? Oh, yes! Take it! You'll have no beginning of use with it! Uh, don't you mean no end of use? Of course! Whatever you say, dear! You hear Angelina murdering tearfully to herself as she exits. Finally, I have the final ingredient for that marvelous youth potion! I am going to beat you to the punch, my dear Hagatha! Serves you right for hoarding this sweet, juicy thing to yourself! You feel a nauseous tinge in your stomach. At, at least the lamp is now yours. You take the old lamp. Okay. So, uh... We may not have done a good deed. The old lamp, the oil lamp, is fashioned of brass and has been tarnished. There is a spout at one end and a round handle at the other. The lamp is empty inside. Well, let's rub it. You rub the lamp and wait expectantly, but nothing happens. 
You were about to give it another try when a small puff of smoke appears at the end of the spout. It clears, revealing a note. As you remove it, the lamp disappears. You read the scroll. To the unlucky fool who bought this lamp. As you may have gathered, this lamp no longer contains a fabulous genie. As my former master, praise him and his greatness, has released me with his final wish. However, as a consolation, please be advised of the following. The shopkeeper is not to be tr trusted. She dabbles in the black arts and keeps rather distasteful company. May these words reveal what lies beneath and may your findings lead you to a higher position in life. So hard like a stone, and white like the snow, stands silent the man who guards what's below. May you forever know the beauty of freedom. Signed, Nibor Simawil, Genie. Okay, I'm Googling that. It looks like the first names of the people who worked on the game. I don't know. The, the name doesn't look, look right to me like a real name, but I could be wrong. I don't see anything on Google about it. There is a statue here, which is a statue with a walking stick. It looks a lot like the statue in King's Quest IV that's in the uh, Great Hall of the Castle. You examine the castle, the statue up close. There is a hidden latch. You flick the latch. A trapdoor opens up in the floor. So, sure enough. Did the note go away? Yeah, that's Mon Mon's letter. I guess the scroll from the genie disappears. Um. There we go. You close the trapdoor behind you. Okay. I'm a little scared because this seems unwise. A beam of light filters from a crack in the floorboards above. Several large items have been covered with cloth to protect them from dust down here. You see a letter on the desk. Well, let's do some more reading. You read the letter sitting on the desk. Angelina, once again, I put to you an invitation to join our illustrious community. Unsurprisingly, you have heard of its reputation through other channels. I personally encourage you to give it serious thought. We are not only interested in new membership from the mages of this world. This invitation goes out to all who believe that when the appointed time comes, only the faithful will be rewarded. The rest of those poor, unenlightened fools will perish. All that is asked in return is complete allegiance to the Father. He has guided us from the beginning, and his power is far older than most. I know you are hesitant due to concerns regarding the dress code. Let me assure you that Black would look simply charming on you, dear. My gratitude comes out to you for your flattering assertion that I would make a fine ruler of Kolima. What a shame that the former ruler has lost all interest in his homeland. I cannot blame him, however. The change struck him quite hard. To answer your earlier question, yes, I have acquired a nightingale. They are most in common in this region, and yes, I am quite sure that it is the final ingredient required to complete my youth potion. As much as I would like to share it with you, I am afraid that a single nightingale will provide only enough solution for one person. In any event, I shall, of course, pay you a visit the moment the youth potion takes effect. 
Okay. A large double-bladed broadsword leans against the bench. It looks like an expensive antique. Several items have been covered with cloth. You see a colorful, rolled-up carpet. As you pick up the carpet, you notice a small label, which reads, Property of Al Din. There might be a faded letter or two in there, but you cannot be sure. Like Aladdin? Above you, from the back room, you discern Angela's voice. I did it! I did it! The youth potion is finally finished. Now all I need to do is drink it! Angelina, show yourself, you scurvy wench! Hagatha, my dear! What an unexpected sub- Don't play the fool with me! I know you stole it! Stole? Really, I do not know. Silence! For your lies and deceit, there can be only one consequence. No! Please! I can explain! I said silence! Oh, and one more thing. Your invitation to join us is revoked. What is this? Ah, the youth potion at la- Oh no! Drat! Now what was that spell for removing floorboards? Curses. I should have to go back and look it up. Let's just go pick that up. You fish around the pile of down and successfully retrieve the youth potion. We don't need it, but I'm curious. Curious as to whether the youth potion lives up its name, you drink every last drop of the blue liquid. Oh dear. Planning to start your life over? Unfortunately, your fair maiden won't be around by the time you become interested in women again. Well, we better leave before Hagatha comes back. Cautiously, you open the trapdoor ever so slightly and peer into the room above. Hagatha is nowhere to be seen. You make your exit from the basement. You flick the latch. The trapdoor closes and conceals itself into the floorboards once more. Placing your grubby hands all over unsold antiques may not be held in high regard. Is there anything else? You have no desire to go back there. Alright, then let's get out of here. Myself, I would like to rob everything that's in the store, but I guess some people would want to leave. Um, I don't think we should use the magic carpet, which hopefully this is what this is, in town. We'll probably want to get a nice open area that isn't covered in trees. So this seems like a good place to try it out. The, uh, the lamp had a genie and it was magic. It just didn't anymore. So maybe this carpet is magic. You unroll the magic carpet, lay it on the ground, and sit on it. The carpet begins to rise skyward. As you ascend higher, you realize that the carpet is beyond your control. It glides through the air on a seemingly predetermined course. Okay. It looks like... Uh... The sky is splendid during the height of the day. The view is incredible from up here. Below lies the land of Kolima, stretched out before you. You can make out the coastline, most of the forest, and a dismal swampy area to the north. It is a snake! 
and we don't have a tamarine. A snake blocks your path to the east. It appears about 10 feet long and is coiled, ready to strike. Do we have any music making equipment at all? We don't. We have the opal necklace that the mermaid gave us. You dangle the shimmering opal in front of the snake. It soon, fall, it soon falls hypnotized in typical snake fashion. Really? Is hypnotism a typical snake thing? But either way, we're past it. In the original King's Quest 1, or, or 2, sorry, in the original Sierra King's Quest 2, this hole contained an advertisement for Space Quest. You reach into the cavity and feel around. What is this? You've discovered a button hidden inside the rock. You press it and wait to see what happens next. Ha! <laughs> In an instant, a man stands beside you. He appears to be somewhat of an adventurer, much like yourself. That is the hero from Quest for Glory 2. Greetings. I'm King Graham of Daventry. The newcomer nods in greeting. Without a word, he respectfully appraises you. You notice about him the manner of one who has only recently learned the meaning of heroism. From where do you hail, good sir? The man opens his mouth to answer, but then pauses to consider that question. Evidently deciding that irrelevant exposition would serve neither party, he casually gestures to the hole in the rock behind you. Might I inquire something of your identity? After a brief search of his own person, the man pulls out a scroll card and hands it to you. You unroll it and re reads, Having fulfilled the requirements in accordance with the statutes of the famous adventurer's correspondence school, the bearer is a qualified would-be hero. The man also shows you a medallion. Upon it are the words hero of Spielberg. You reverently return the scroll to the man. You don't say much, do you? With a sigh of resignation, the man shakes his head silently. Surely you might speak to me of your adventures. The man becomes quite enthused about the prospect of relating his most recent adventure to you. Just as he is about to speak, however, you notice something on the ground the man must have dropped. You retrieve the paper. It appears to be a scroll. Upon it is some writing. Disclaimer, you have just witnessed a rather shameless plug for the remake of Quest for Glory 2 Trial by Fire by the entities of AGD Interactive. Available now! As you read the writing, the words are ingrained in your mind. The scroll disappears. So, whereas Sierra used this to uh, promo their Space Quest game, uh, AGD is using it to promo their Quest for Glory remake. Very nice, very cute. We are coming up on the hour mark. So I am going to pause the let's play here. And when we come back, we'll pick up with hopefully retrieving the air gem. Uh, I did mean to say, and I completely forgot to say, uh, what some of the differences so far. So, uh, in the original King's Quest II Sierra game, the way you get the, the key, the first key, it's not the blue gem in that game, it's the first key, is there is a trident that has washed up along the shore, and you just pick it up, uh, and then the mermaid, when she takes you underwater... Uh, I don't remember why she befriends you. Maybe you give her the pearl. And and maybe that's why it's kind of funny that the, the game is like, no, no, she's seen pearls before. But I, I can't remember, to be honest. I know you don't go back to a town and get a comb from a merchant because there is no town and there is no merchant in the original. Um, but anyway, the mermaid takes you underwater and you give the trident to the King Neptune there and he gives you, or there's a chest there and you open it and the key is in there. 
if I if I remember correctly. Uh, so it's it's not the whole sequence with the sharkies and rescuing the trident. Uh, that was all new. In the uh, for the second king, which here is the air gem, you uh, go up into the clouds. I don't remember how. I really don't remember off the top of my head. But the snake, uh, it, it, you, there's a genie. I remember that. Uh, you you rub the genie's lamp and he gives you gifts. And one of the gifts he gives you is a enchanted bridle. And when you get to the snake, you throw the bridle onto the snake. And it turns into a horse and gives you... Um, some items in order to to uh, proceed with the game. And how are you supposed to know to throw a bridle onto a snake? I truly do not know. Um, but so those are some of the differences that uh, uh, between the original and this remake. Um, and I will link the the original playthrough uh, in the description so that you can watch it. Like I said, it's not very long. It's like 26 minutes. And it's, it's worth watching just from a, oh, interesting history of um, a video game's perspective. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and cut the video here. And uh, we will pick up in the next video. Once again, my name is Anna Mardal. And this is the AGD Interactive of uh, King's Quest 2. And thank you for coming along with me. Bye-bye.